Yeah. Right. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, I'm not showing me. And welcome to our latest uh, lockdown lecture. Uh, my name is Lynn Julius, and I'm here with my husband, Lawrence, who's also my technical advisor. Uh, and we are volunteers with Harif. Harif is the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And there are five of us volunteers. Um, and we aim to raise awareness of the history and culture of these Jews. If you don't know about Harif, please do join our mailing list and keep up to date with our activities. Our website is www.harif.org. And we have a sister blog called Point of No Return, which keeps you up to date uh, with the news. This session will be live streamed to the Harif Facebook page. And we apologize to all those who couldn't get into the meeting, but we hope that you're there following the proceedings on the Facebook page. There will be a recording of this session and we will upload this to our website in due course. If you have any questions for our speakers, please do type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Tonight, we will be focusing on the Jews of Mashhad in Iran. These were the crypto Jews of Islam, forced to convert outwardly, yet continuing to practice Judaism in secret. Later on, I will be interviewing Esther Amini, the daughter of Mashadi Jews, who has written a brilliant memoir, Concealed, about her Mashadi background and how this shaped her life. But first, Dr. Meron Lavi will give us a potted history of this unique community. Uh, Meron is an engineering consultant whose Mashadi parents moved to Tehran uh, where he was born and then the family moved to the UK. So without more ado, over to you Miran for a history of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Lynn. Um, first of all, I must say that the talk that I'm going to give would be actually pre-recorded talk. And then you will probably hear a lot of pauses. So uh, those pauses are actually because of me. <laughs> it is not due to Zoom. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to add just the sets. <laughs> so here we go. Um, yes. Hello and good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Harif for uh, organizing this event and for giving the opportunity to um, give this short talk. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my peers at the Mercedes Center in Great Neck for making available some of the illustrations that would be presented in this talk. Um, it's not an easy task to give a talk in the time allowed on the history of a Jewish community that was part of one of the most ancient empires and whose roots stretch back centuries before the common era. However, I will try to highlight the important and sometimes poignant eras in their lives in that ancient land. So if we uh, look at the first illustration, uh, this is the uh, map of um, the old Persian Empire and uh, re, uh, uh, dating back to the new Babylonian period. And one can see that we stretched all the way from Levant to the present Afghanistan and India. And um, Jews were living uh, within that period in Persia and also it coincided with the Cyrus II of Persia who occupied Jerusalem 
and allowed the Jews to return to Judea and rebuild the temple. The books of Ezra Nehemiah attest that the second temple was completed in the sixth year of Darius the Great. This is the final chapter in the historical narrative of the Jewish Bible. The more affluent Jews stayed in Babylon or moved mainly to Western Persia, namely to the provinces of Dilaman, Kashan, and Qazvin. So, um, <clears throat> four, uh, four uh, different events uh, really um, <clears throat> distinguish um, the Jewish of Mashhad from their fellow Jews elsewhere in Persia, and indeed, those Jews living in the Middle East during the same period. So I will touch upon each in turn. So if we now uh, fast forward by about two millennium, uh, we will reach the, um, <clears throat> the um, second half of the 18th century when Nader Shah of the Afshar dynasty ruled. And he was a great conqueror, known as the Napoleon of Persia, because of the vast empire that he built, stretching eastward from the present-day Oman and UAE, Turkmenistan and Iraq, and penetrated into Georgia, Azerbaijan, and India. And uh, this is uh, uh, the conqueror himself on a horseback. Nader Shah was impressed by the trustworthiness of the Jews. They had a reputation as good financiers and honest business people. He brought 40 families to the city of Mashhad to run his business and guard his vast treasures. 17 families were sent to Kalat, the city nearest to his seat. So um, if you look at this sketched map, we will see uh, the white arrows uh, indicating the migration routes taken uh, from the western province of Persia to Meshed and Kalat, situated in the northeastern part of the country. Mashhad hosts the shrine of the eight Shia Imam and is one of the holiest cities of Iran. It was and still is rich in culture, resources, as an important trading center. Because of its religious significance, the city had no tolerance towards religious minorities, especially the Jews, which Islam regarded as unclean. The very observant and religious Jewish community of Mashhad is therefore unique in Iran's recent history. And for reasons that will become clear later, they are known for uh, living a double life. And uh, for want a better phrase, the Jews of Islam, the Jews of Nader Shah, or the crypto Jews. So uh, the Shah was regarded as the savior of the Jews, but his reign came to an abrupt end after his assassination in 1747. And um, that changed the part of history for Mashhad Jews, for better or for worse. The country was fragmented and revolts erupted under the Qajar dynasty. It was a ruthless regime with disregard for religious minorities. The Jews in Kalat had little choice but to join the larger community of nearby Mashhad. Interestingly, some families acquired their names from the cities that they came from. Younger generations still bear those names, like the Delmanians or the Kashanians, or perhaps the Kalatis. So the second event, and arguably the most poignant uh, for Jewish uh, uh, Meshedis, uh, and in, well, for the Jews of the Middle East in general, was the Aladadi period. Aladad was a day when the entire community was forced to convert to Islam. The term means God-given or God's justice. There are a number of explanations for what set off the Aladadi. Here is one account that I read out. 
On the 12th day of Nissan of the year 5,599, corresponding to the year 1839, a poor woman had a sore hand. A Muslim physician advised her to kill a dog and put her hand in its blood. She did so. In another version, the incident happened during the Shia holy month of Muharram. The Shias were marching in the streets in memory of an imam when the Jewish woman was uh, uh, throwing away the dog she killed for medical reasons. She was accused of deliberately offending the Shias. This was probably a false rumor and dog was used as a pretext as both Islamic and Jewish laws would consider dog's blood to be impure. The culmination, all the hatred towards the Jews and the brutality of the Gaja rulers led to mob rule. The governor Mashat ordered his men to enter the Jewish homes. Mobs attacked the Jewish community, burning down the synagogue, looting homes, abducting girls, and killing between 30 and 40 people. The Jewish patriots were forced to loudly proclaim their allegiance to Islam. The community agreed that in order to spare the remaining 2,400 Jews, everyone must convert. Most did so and stayed in Masha, taking the Muslim names, while a minority left to join other Iranian Jewish communities and moved away to Afghanistan and Russian provinces. Those who were forcefully converted were known as Jadid al-Islam, meaning new Muslims. However, the majority of the community who remained became more zealous than ever and continued to adhere tenaciously, though in secret, to their Jewish faith. They kept all the Orthodox Jewish uh, precepts to the full while outwardly appearing to uh, be Muslims. Slide shows the only handwritten coded text script on the Aladat found inside the cover of a volume of the Book of Zohar. It recounts the events that led to the forced conversion. And here we have a picture of the Eidgar or ghetto where Jews used to live in Mashhad. It was secluded and rather shabby. In order to conceal their religion, men went on pilgrimage to Mecca. Upon their return, they took on the title Haji. And in this picture, circa 1900, uh, we see the so-called Meshadi Hajis with full Islamic turban, including the headgear called Imame. Girls were betrothed to Jewish boys at an early age to prevent forced marriage to outsiders. Commonly, they had two marriage certificates, one Jewish and the other Islamic. So here um, we have a picture of a typical wedding related ceremony from the early 1940s as tradition to local customs and Orthodox Jewry, the guests were um, once invited to the bride's home and uh, 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 the, 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 uh, for the women's uh, participants and uh, um, um, and once to that of the grooms for men. And uh, here we have the pair of marriage certificate dating back to the 1853, which, is, which was elaborately decorated at the time in watercolor pen and ink. So, um, Mashadi Jews also devised their own Hebrew Persian written language. It was only understood by the elders. Miniature teflin, such as this shown in this picture, could be well, a device also, which could be hidden under men's robes. And weekly parishals were printed as a series of booklets to resemble Islamic surahs. They are still used by some Mashadi Jews. So, they lived a double life in fear for almost a century. The bleak situation was compounded by the outbreak of the Second World War.
with these uncertainties and calamities. But the Jews remained vigilant. They were highly integrated, just like a large family. They were disciplined, and decisions uh, were made, and moves were made collectively. Women, indeed, played a major part in preserving the Jewish identity and also their faith because somewhat they were excluded from the mainstream Iranian society at the time. So they could concentrate more on their homes. Um, and in contrast, uh, the Jewish communities in Iran were able to enjoy more freedom and access to education than the Meshedi Jews. However, some Meshedi boys and girls did attend school and a few for example, my own father went on to high school. The curriculum included compulsory religious studies. Later, my father while closing, closely guarding his Jewish identity, briefly became a teacher in the same school that he was taught. He was probably the only Jewish teacher in an Islamic school within the province. And uh, here we have a slide of a typical uh, school in Masha dating to about 1922, no, sorry, 1922. Note the strict dress code for both the pupils and the staff. The third momentous period for Masha Jews happened between the start of the Second World War and the mid-1950s. Under the rule of Reza Shah of the Pahlavi dynasty, from 1925 onwards, there were increasing opportunities and religious freedoms for Jews in larger cities, especially Tehran. Most were oriental carpet dealers and moved to the capital where they found opportunities in trade, business, recreational, and vocation. All denied to them while living in Mashhad. All the skill, talents, and ambitions they were hidden away for so long burst forth. The first group of Mashhad Jews broke ranks with their elders. They went on to further education and graduated from Asia's most prestigious university, Tehran. Some even went to hold uh, senior positions in their disciplines. So uh, here we have a picture circa 1945. You see my father, Mr. Mohandes Mohiba. on the left. He was one of the first university graduates within our community. <clears throat> and later, he held a senior position in the petroleum industry. He is flanked by the physicians, Dr. Yakutiel and Dr. Bastali, his classmates. Others notably were Dr. Um, Rajabzadeh and also the vet Dr. Hakimian. The exodus from Mashhad picked up between 1946 and 48. By the early 1950s, Jewish life in the city was almost non-existent. The community was much more liberated in Tehran and enjoyed freedom and respect from the regime of Mohammad Reza Shah on an unimaginable scale. Jews tried and faced little persecution. Some gained recognition uh, within the wider community of Iranian society. And, uh, in this picture, 
uh, circa 1975, on the far left, we see the towering figure of a prominent, of a very prominent Mashadi businessman, Mr. Mehdi Tulu, invited with other delegates to the court of the Shah. He later immigrated to the United States and one of the uh, founders of a large synagogue and community center for the Mashadis in New York. The Islamic Revolution in 1979 marked the turning point in the life of the Mashadi community and other minorities in Iran. It was the catalyst for the Mashadi Jewish community to migrate in its entirety to the United States, Israel, and the UK. Mashadi Jews in New York are the largest in diaspora and are united just like a family with their own synagogues, community centers, and other facilities. And uh, I just uh, briefly show you uh, this picture, which uh, is uh, of uh, one of the shoes that Mashadis have in actually Great Neck, New York. So uh, the Mashadi Jews have never really witnessed or experienced the lives of their parents in Iran. However, with the unique and highly integrated social life outside Iran and the negligible rate of intermarriage, they have upheld their traditions. They are well educated, informed, and those living in New York are involved in the wider academic, corporate, and political institutions. Notably, the Anglo Meshedi Jews um, uh, founded their synagogue in Stanford Hill in mid 1920s and briefly uh, moved to West England and then moved back to uh, North London, uh, where, they, uh, where the main community uh, uh, lives now and they have their own shoe. So um, embedded in its long history and very rich culture of the Iranian society, the uh, uh, majority of the times they have tolerated religious minorities and Jews were no exception. The present Islamic Republic is no different from its predecessors, and it encourages the Jews to participate openly in their day-to-day -day religious and ritual activities. Uh, telling the history of an ancient country like Iran will not be complete unless I mention the warmth and hospitality of its people, love for home and family, and, uh, uh, and the very tasty uh, and world-renowned dishes that are so characteristic of the Iranian society and enrich their everyday lives. Because of uh, Iran's strong culture, these traditions persisted in Jewish homes to this day. And uh, here uh, we have examples of the more colorful dishes that will satisfy even the most <laughs> delicate palate. Some are unique to Persia and include delicious sweets some, uh, uh, some of the dishes are even centuries old in actually recipes. And uh, this is another example. Persian halva is not like the regular halva. It has a soft play dough. The taste is heavenly and very exotic. Persian halva is intertwined with many aspects of the life of Persian Jewry. It is the food of choice after fast and it's also one of the essential foods to be given away on Purim for Mishloir Mano. But uh, over the centuries, it's become customary to distribute the halva to friends and families and sometimes in the names of the departed, the departed sorry, loved ones. And uh, on that note, on that sweet note rather, I would like to conclude this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miran, and thank you for all the hard work that went into that presentation. Uh, now, I, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Esther Amini. Uh, Esther Amini is joining us from New York. She was born in the US of Mashadi parents, uh, who left the city after World War II. Uh, Esther is a writer, painter, and psychoanalytic psychotherapist. 
Her memoir, uh, Concealed, which I have here, Caught Between the Chador and America, or I should say America, as your mother might have said, came out this year and has been widely acclaimed. So welcome, Esther. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> So the title of your book is Concealed, and I find it fitting that, that you share your name with Queen Esther, a figure who concealed her own identity in the court of Ahasuerus. And in many ways, you lived a double life. Even though your, fa uh, your family had left Mashhad, there was the revealed self and the underground Esther. Can you give us some examples, please? Well, of course, but I have to backtrack and probably repeat some of what Mehran has already said. Um, my parents were raised in Mashhad, uh, and they come from a long line of ancestors who lived in Mashhad. So this whole feeling of hiding who you are, uh, leading a dual life, a life of duplicity, pretending you're someone you're not, uh, really went into their DNA. And that was very much how they felt and how they lived. Um, and girls back then, during my parents' generation, were not raised to develop their minds. They were raised to get married at a young age. And so, for example, my grandmother, this is my father's mother, was married at the age of nine to my grandfather, who was 29. And this was the norm at the time. My mother, at the age of 14, was forced to marry my father, who was then 34. So if you hold that up as a template, I'm born in the United States. My parents arrived here in 1947, right after World War II. And a few years later, I was born, and my father now has a daughter. Uh, I have two older brothers, but I'm the first girl, and he has a daughter, and he's raising her in this country with a mashadi formula in his mind, which is girls should be raised to marry at a young age, and to become educated is detrimental to a marriage. This was very much his thinking. Um, and so what I had to hide was my curiosity, uh, my need to read, my wish to read. My father forbade books and did not want me reading. And so I, of course, did the opposite. And I would get into bed at night with stacks of books and a flashlight in hand. And under the covers, I'd be avidly reading. That was my concealed self, the part of me that I didn't want him to see or know. Um, and so as he concealed his Judaism, I had to conceal my mind. Um, and in a way, he became my mashad. Uh, the part of me that remained hidden uh, for fear of being disowned, uh, not losing my life so much, but rather close to it. <laughs> um, would you like to read a, a short passage from your book to illustrate um, how you felt? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to read to you the very, very beginning which is the prologue um, and it's entitled Invisible. Esther is not here. Gwendolyn, my third grade classmate, had come over to play. As soon as she walked through our front door, dressed in pink and blue argyle socks and a matching cardigan, my father gave her a stabbing stare. Esther is not here, he said icily. I was standing right there, right next to him, in plain view. Gwen's eyes met mine. 
I quickly looked away and tried to hide in the spaces between his words. With a ferocious wave, Pop sent her away and swept back into the living room without a glance in, her, in my direction. I was invisible to him. I looked at my feet, touched my elbows, then began shaking like a rag doll. My mind gunked up. Could he be right? Am I imagining me? The shame was immense, a heart punch. Would Gwen tell our entire class what had just happened? Would she say Esther's father is Iranian and that's what they do? It wasn't the first time Pop had insisted I wasn't visible when I was, but I was no less mortified. How could I be unseen when seen? How could I disappear upon demand? I didn't call out, I am here. I was afraid of words. Pop often cautioned, speech makes lips unclean. So at age eight, fearing his angry outbursts and wanting clean lips, I chose silence. I wish my mother were home. She, born with sword in hand, would never have let this happen. She would have shoved Pop aside, invited Gwen in, and offered her trays of piping hot, homemade Persian pastries. Gwen would have loved my mother and been fooled into thinking my home was much like hers. She'd never know what I knew. By third grade, I was practicing shrinking, abiding by Pop's rules to avoid his wrath. I ate little, spoke minimally, breathed soundlessly, while my mother worked at becoming ever more visible, expanding to the point of bursting, no matter the consequence. I was a consequence. So invisibility was definitely one aspect of, of being in a Mashadi family. Were there others, uh, were there other cultural differences that were specific to the Mashadi community and which were not to be found, say, in other Iranian Jews? Uh, well, I can only speak about my family and uh, I really can't make generic statements like that. But I can tell you my father was an extreme person and he was very traditional. And in retrospect, you know, I, at the time when I felt those feelings, I didn't understand. I thought this was crazy. It was, it was crazy making for me that I should be standing there and be told that I'm not there. But in hindsight, I understand it totally. Uh, you know, my father was very afraid of the outside world infiltrating and shaping and changing us. He never liked America. Uh, he, he viewed the country as decadent, hedonistic, amoral. And so for him, he was really protecting me. You know, a little eight-year-old girl who wanted to come over to play was America entering our living room mm -hmm. and he wanted to keep her out. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, I'm not saying that every Machete family in New York had this kind of father. Mine was a little on the extreme side um, and I had a very different mother. She was a very strong woman who we'll talk about later, but uh, she was only 14 when she married him. He was 34 and he was a, a dominant character, but she outmuscled him. So there was a lot of conflict at home. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's typical of every Machete family. That was my family. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you make the point that uh, when your mother had these gatherings of other Persian ladies, they would all moan and complain about their husbands. And it was as if they were all complaining about the same man. Isn't yes. So? Yes, that is true. That is true. I mean, now that you point that out, um, as a whole, you know, I, I would be eavesdropping. I'd be in the kitchen listening to them as they were baking together and they would be whining and complaining about their husbands that they don't feel that they're appreciated. They're taken for granted. Uh, their husbands would come home from work and just want to be fed and left alone with their newspapers. And, and these women wanted conversation and they wanted to be taken out and they wanted, 
to be seen and heard. Um, and yes, uh, the role of a Mashadi woman is, is very specific. Um, the ideal Mashadi woman is beautiful and an excellent cook and quiet and deferential. Uh, and so anything that feeds that concept uh, is condoned. Uh, going to school, becoming educated, having a mind of your own is dangerous because according to that Mashadi perception, uh, that kind of female is going to undermine the sanctity of marriage. Uh, the pervading wisdom at the time when my parents were raising me, the pervading wisdom at the time was that an uneducated girl would make an excellent wife. Um, so that had a lot to do with their roots. My mother was never schooled. She was illiterate. Uh, many girls were kept that way. I'm not saying every, but many. And my mother came from a long line of women who never learned to read or write, and mm -hmm. as was my father's mother, uh, also illiterate. So education was considered dangerous, maybe given a little bit, but needs to be stopped at a certain point. Um, and uh, that, that was very clear in my household. You describe a very funny scene when you, uh, you, you go along to the theatre with your brother who is, um, who is very interested in, in English literature and you take your mother along in her best clothes to see Othello. That's um, right. And she, she can hardly follow the Shakespearean English and she keeps saying, what did he say? What did he say? <laughs> That's right. That's right. You get the impression that she is desperate to integrate into American society, and yet she is so limited by her lack of education and her lack of literacy. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. She was a, uh, a very complicated person in many ways. Uh, she was, when she was born, her mother died. So her mother died giving birth to her. Uh, and her father died when she was about two years old. So she had zero memory of either parent. She was raised by a wonderful woman, Yochevet, who married her father before he died. And so Yochevet was the only remaining parent and she raised my mother. And my mother believed that this was her genetic mother and called her Mamon John, which means mother dearest, a beloved mother. Um, and some stranger at the eight, when she was around 10 years old, I think it was a neighbor, had said to her, stop calling Yochevet Mamon John. She's not your mother. Your mother died. And that was a traumatic moment in my mother's life, and she never got over it. Mm. Um, she went back to Yochevet and basically told her that she hated Yochevet and she could never trust her again, uh, even though she was a wonderful woman and very kind and caring to my mother. Um, and from that day on, my mother felt deceived and distrusted the outside world. Uh, and above, that, above and beyond that, she was forced to marry my father, who she did not want to marry. Um, she was a strong-willed girl later woman, um, and she was outspoken and she was defiant. Mm -hmm. So the two extremes of my two parents, uh, it was quite a combination. And your father, who of course was the diametric opposite of your mother, he seemed to have certain emotional baggage as well, which he brought from Mashad. Can you- Absolutely, elaborate? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he, he was raised by a very difficult father. His father was uh, strict as an understatement. Uh, his father was foreboding and the children were all terrified of him. Uh, his father forbade speech in the home and they had to sit around the dining table, around the Shabbat table with lips sealed 
And so he grew up not being able to express himself freely. I mean, he certainly could talk, but he could never access his emotions or his thoughts in great, to great length. And he had a rather compromised childhood. Um, and then, of course, there was Mashad on top of it. This is a layer cake. And then there's Mashad that was a very repressed uh, society to live in. As Mehran pointed out, it is the most fanatically Islamic city in all of Iran with zero tolerance for difference. And so my father having to hide his Judaism, uh, a paranoia developed and a fear of the outside world, which he brought to the United States. Uh, and so his way of coping with all of this was what by hiding, I mean, withdrawing, becoming highly introverted, a man of silence, a man of few words, uh, wanting to keep the outside world out completely. Um, and that's how he navigated. My mother did the exact reverse with her background, an orphan, feeling deceived, forced to marry a man she didn't want to marry. She was the most outspoken woman I ever met in my life. She was larger than life, at times terrifying, because she was impulsive. And, um, and to her credit, she was also uh, very suspicious of authority figures and didn't kowtow always relied on her own thinking and her own mind, sometimes correctly, sometimes not so correctly, uh, but was a, a rebellious character. Uh, and- uh, can, I you, can I ask you to read that uh, short passage about her insisting on, on learning to drive? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and where did she go? <laughs> okay. My mother, keep in mind, was illiterate. Uh, and she was determined to learn to drive a car when she moved to Kew Gardens, Queens. This is New York City. Um, and in order to drive a car, you have to pass two tests, a written test and a driving test. And to this day, we have no clue as to how she did this but she passed. And this is the passage I'm going to read. Other drivers honked like hell, their hands simultaneously slamming their steering wheels and foreheads. Male middle fingers shot out of rolled down windows. In return, mom with a carefree smile waved back and continued to blissfully cut in and out of speeding lanes riding shotgun in a time before seat belts, reading signs to her, watching for other cars, head swiveling, nails digging deeper and deeper into the upholstery. I was her navigator, her co-pilot, rear view mirror, shouting, not now, mom, wait, now, go. It was terrifying. And yet each time she asked, Esther, you want to go to airport with me? I went, I never said no. Driving was my mother's fix. With windows wide open, she sped along and sung to the blast of rock and roll radio like some daredevil teen. On steamy summer nights, as her hair blew every which way, she'd tell me to lift my arms, expose my armpits, and cool off in the wild wind. Mom's joyride peaked once she reached Idlewild Airport, gliding over ramps, racing from one airline terminal to another, recklessly flooring the gas pedal. We flew by Pan Am, TWA, Iceland, Iceland Air, KLM, Swiss Air, and of course, El Al. Sailing over intertwining lanes, her face softened. The unobstructed cobalt sky was hers, now that my father was nowhere to be seen. Blithely, she was flying her own private jet. On these summer nights, she rang of freedom. For an hour, mom cruised over every available ribboning ramp over and over again, jetting away into the can-do night, 
before turning to me and saying, ready, go home? If she was ready, then I was too. These twilight trips began when I was 10 and continued each summer into my teens. When my brother Albert was studying architecture at Cornell and my brother David was mastering English literature at Columbia, mom and I were riding ramps. By the time I turned 14, I understood that these evenings weren't just about cooling armpits or visiting an airport, nor was I risking my life just to be compliant. I now accompanied mom summer after summer with a very different agenda, hoping her intrepid spirit would seep into me. Each summer evening I rode beside mom, absorbing her willfulness, siphoning her strength. Oh, what a wonderful passage. Thank you very much for that, Esther. And Thank you. I do recommend Esther's book, Concealed, with that absolutely gorgeous picture of you as a three-year-old holding an American flag and standing on a Persian carpet, which probably <laughs> sums up the kind of paradox. <laughs> uh, I just want to bring in uh, some of our audience here because there's there's a lady who's desperate to share her experience um, is it Pauline Pauline who is with um, Ruth Golding we're just finding her here you should give me pre-warning Lenny don't, don't just, want it. I didn't sorry we're just finding Ruth now. Is it? Um, I, I, think, I we don't have the name. Ruth Gold, uh, I don't have a Ruth Golding. Ruth, someone who's just described herself as Ruth. But she said yeah. Ruth and entered the meeting. Is it Ruth, Ruth Goldman? No? I don't know who it is. My name is Pauline Aminoff. Uh, my husband used to be Matt Aminoff, who I think is uh, your father. Esther. Uh, Esther, your father's. Uh, very good friend and cousin. Yes. They were very yes. close, actually. Yes. Uh, first, yes. Cousin. first cousin. First cousins. Anyway, um, I'm an off now, so I know everything <laughs> about uh, the, the Aminoffs. And yes. uh, we have a lovely family. We have a lovely home. My children are all around me. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren are all around me, walking distance to me. So I How see them you? almost every day. Why and I'm very, I'm very lucky. lucky. I'm extremely lucky. <laughs> and we're lovely to hear your story. Say, say that you enjoyed her book. I enjoyed your book. <laughs> I've recommended it to many, many people, and they also enjoyed it. Thank and you. it's lovely meeting you now. And uh, anyway, you're a wonderful person. <laughs> well, thank you. Great to meet okay. you. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm Pauline's daughter, and uh, we are second cousins, it seems. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Great to meet you. But you have quite an interesting story, don't you, Ruth? Or rather, your mother has? My mother has, but she's not really prepared to speak about it now. It's a bit uh, late for her. What a shame. Oh, that's a pity. Another time. Another that's time. Another time. Okay. Can we ask... Um, Harold Road, perhaps, to share his experiences of, of being at university in, in Iran. Um, I think he studied at the University of, um, of, of Mashhad. Oh, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Oh, no. Hi, hi. Yeah. In uh, 1978, for, I don't know, five, six months, during the early and mid stages of the revolution, I was studying in Mashhad wow. at uh, University, um, Fardosi University. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. There were six American Jews in our uh, program. Uh, it was interesting to watch the city fall apart in, um, uh, 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 at that time. But on Shabbat, we skipped school, we skipped university, and we went in Itgah to the shul to pray. Uh, most of us, myself included at the time, there were, I think, two of the six of us were religious. I, at the time, was not. And um, 
it, there were, I think, only six Jewish men. We made up the minyan. There was a minyan because of the American Jews at that time. Well, um, they had, it was very, very clear that they were, um, uh, uh, were a, um, uh, um, uh, a lot of things were hide, hidden, a lot of were different. What was interesting is they sold the aliyot for the Torah on Shabbat. And what was fascinating is unlike, for example, in reform synagogues in the United States, uh, you bid on them and you have to pay right there. Some of us were a little surprised because, you know, we're not supposed to use money on Shabbat. And the guy who was running the show, and I don't remember the name, I remember this is 1978, uh, said, well, you know, we at times, uh, you know what they say about us. We're afraid that if uh, people bid, they won't pay if they don't have to pay right in front of everybody else. Anyway, um, I must say uh, the city was in turmoil and the, the families that were there were, shall we say, uh, practicing Dariye, which is um, pretending to be who you were not. They did not go around and announce to the world, to my knowledge, that they were Jews. But it was a very secretive thing even to come to synagogue. But uh, uh, that was all that was left at the time, six families. And... Uh, uh, but uh, again, a fascinating experience. We ourselves, by September, had to flee. Uh, we, we fled to Afghanistan across the border. Um, they used to take roll every morning in synagogue, excuse me, in synagogue in at university. And we timed it so we would be across the border by the time uh, they took roll, which was noon. Now, we also uh, prayed in Herat, the first city was there. There were 20, in the Afghanistan at the time, I think there were 26 uh, Jews, which we found. Uh, and uh, uh, they historically, they were Persian speaking, and they historically had a strong connection to Mashhad, the Jews in Mashhad. But once the border was created, uh, uh, it, it, it sort of broke off. Now, um, uh, I think uh, one of the two speakers before talked about how uh, the Jews had, when they were forced in 1839 to convert to Islam, and people fled into Central Asia at the time, into Samarkand and Bukhara, um, and then other places. Uh, they also fled into um, Afghanistan. There were those uh, stories that, that, that we heard. But, you know, it's a different world. I find it very different difficult to believe in this fanatically religious and anti-non-Muslim uh, um, anti city where we studied they, that, they, um, uh, uh, that uh, the Jews had it easy. I, I just cannot imagine even why those six families that stayed, but it's very easy to talk about other people and why would they do if you don't live their lives. can only say one thing. The guy that I was traveling with his father was a Jew. His mother was a convert to Judaism here in the United States. She was of German origin, and he looked like her. When we had to, unfortunately, given the rules in Afghanistan, we knew that when we went there, we had to go out a different border. But they changed the rules. We had, in the end, in September, late September, to go back to Iran. There was no way out for us. And we got to Masha. Now, Someone mentioned the idea, I, uh, the gentleman who spoke before, uh, of religious uncleanliness. And uh, uh, my friend looked, the, my, the guy I was traveling with, looked like his mother. Again, he did not look, I was at the time, dark hair, dark, black hair, black, you know, brown eyes, not now. And uh, he looked like his mother. And we couldn't find a place in a hotel because we were... Najes, they, they even though my, both of us knew Quran very well and my friend could recite it, they didn't believe that he was a Muslim. They believed that I was because of the way I looked. Anyway, we went from hotel to hotel to hotel. Finally, what we did is we, they wouldn't accept us and we couldn't go back to university because we had fled the university and God knows what would have happened to us. 
but it was very clear. It was a very hostile place to non-Jews, and I have nothing but the deepest respect for the Jews of Mashhad, who from 1839, when they were forced to convert, to 1916, when they were allowed to return to Judaism, from what I understand, according to their traditions, that we had only three people, we only lost three people who stayed Muslim. The rest ended up returning to Judaism. That's amazing. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Harold. I'd like to go to uh, Rachel Friedman now. Um, Thank you. Yes, please go ahead, Rachel. Thank you. <clears throat> Firstly, I have read your book, Esther really interesting. Uh, my family name was Haruni and my sister Nohana was a Raminov. She was uh, of Rain's daughter, one of the daughters. My family were very poor in Iran, unlike the Aminovs. <laughs> my mother married when she was 12 my father always traveled to earn money. He went to, to Russia, to all over Iran, and, uh, and then to India. I was born in India. My mother had uh, four children in Iran. My eldest brother, Eli, went with my paternal grandmother when he was 10. She took two, three grandchildren, two granddaughters and grandson. And on her passport, she entered their names as her children. And where they traveled overland to Palestine. And when the British at the border talked to her, she said that they are her children and they left them in. The history of the family in Mashhad was that both my great-grandmother, paternal great-grandmother, called Rachel, that I named after, and also my paternal grandmother, were leading women of the community they were midwives, they were herbalists, pharmacists, and they would go and pick flowers to make remedies and help brides with their weddings and prepare them for married life. And my grandmother was even asked by a Muslim man late one night to come and help his wife. And she was really afraid to go because she said, if I don't succeed, you're going to kill me. And he had his little boy with him. So he said to her, I will leave my little boy here as guarantee. And then please come and help my wife. With that, she took the little boy's hand and they went and she successfully delivered the baby, and uh, they were very, very grateful. Um, my, sorry, I'm jumping a bit. My father was in India, and, and the persecution in Mashhad was so severe that eventually my mother went overland all the way by Afghanistan overland to India with three young children on the back of a lorry. My father met them on the border with Pakistan and eventually they were, got to Bombay uh, by train. And there she had two more children, my brother Matt and myself. Unfortunately, when I was four, my father passed away. And my brother, Ellie, the eldest one, who had just got married, um, they came to India, he and his bride, and they took over the whole family 
and look responsibility and looked after everyone financially and they sent my mother and my three younger siblings to London where we were there for a year we couldn't stay the British wouldn't let us so we went to Israel where my maternal grandparents were there my paternal grandmother had passed away by then in Jerusalem and I lived there until I was 14 I went to school and eventually my brother Ellie had come to London he brought the whole family over to London and everybody was educated by then my mother taught herself to read the Rashi they wrote in Rashi with, with Persian words and she also taught herself Hebrew she always read the psalm book, the Tehillim and the Siddur, and eventually she could even read an English newspaper. Um, my brothers all succeeded in business, thank God. They all made Aliyah, living in Israel, my siblings, I'm the only one in London. And I was the rebel in the family because I did not agree to an arranged marriage and I married an Ashkenazi ah. who they, who they <laughs> in, in the 1960s this was and when he walked in they looked at him as if he landed from the moon <laughs> uh, and when they offered him rice he looked like it was he looked at it like it landed from the moon as well because he wasn't brought up with that <laughs> um, however, we all our families really, really melded together beautifully, and um, so it was a success story and a very happy and positive story. The opposite. While I was reading the book, I wanted to talk to you about my family life in contrast to yours, yes. Esther. Um, and. Um, yeah, so Rachel, I think that was, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I think before we close, I'd like to give the last word to Esther because uh, Rachel, you told us about your supportive elder brother. And I know Esther also had very supportive elder brothers. And can you just tell us about how, in a way, they took the place of your mother in bringing you up? They were amazing. They were truly heroic. Uh, I have one brother, Albert, who is 10 years older than myself, and my brother, David, who's seven years older. And they parented my parents, and they parented me. Uh, I, I have so many different stories within the book, and I think I would take up too much time, because I know we have to bring this to a close, but uh, I am eternally, will be eternally, am eternally grateful for the role that they played uh, in wanting to introduce me to literature, uh, wanting to introduce me to education. Uh, all of this was done in hiding and secretly um, and promoting my strengths uh, and preparing me for womanhood the way a mother might. Uh, but they played a very significant role. And I hope that you, those of you who haven't read the book, I hope that you do purchase it, and I hope you do read it and, and get to know the fuller story. On that note, I'd like to thank you very much, Esther. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this meeting and for sharing your uh, stories. Um, if you'd like to keep in touch with uh, Esther and with Kharif, please do uh, write to me at info at harif.org. Uh, please do subscribe to our website um, so to get regular updates. And uh, thank you all for being here with, with us for a, a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much. And do come back again for the next one. Thanks a lot and good Thank night. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye.